series called Elevate. And he had a catchphrase last week that says, I'm not staying here long. I'm moving to a new level. He spoke about having an attitude of gratitude and how our attitude can be a barrier to us reaching the next level. Well, I'm here to talk about a different barrier that's going to stop you from reaching your next level. And it's settling. It's settling for where you are in your Christian life. See, some of you accepted Christ and you haven't gone a lot further than that. In order to reach new levels, we have to do new things. If you've ever gone to a major hotel or a big office building, you'll notice when you get to the lobby, there'll be multiple banks of elevators. And this one will go from the first to the 20th floor, and this one will go from the 21st floor to the 40th floor, and this one will go all the way to the penthouse. Well, your Christian walk's kind of like that. You, you have got saved and you stepped into that first elevator and you push the buttons and you've been going up, but you can't figure out why you've only gone to the 24th. Because you stopped. Because you didn't keep doing the things. No matter how many buttons I push, that elevator isn't going to go past the 20th floor. You have to get off that elevator and get on a different elevator if you want to keep elevating. For most of us, we gave our life over to Christ to get out of a life we had before. We heard about this Jesus guy, we heard about these blessings, and we said, I want that. I, I want my life to be different. journey 
to get Egypt out of the Israelites so that they could have a renewed mindset when they enter the promised land. I'm going to give you a modern day story here because you're like, great, that was then and we don't have chariots and I'm not being chased by the Egyptian army, so how does that relate to me? The movie The Shawshank Redemption. If you don't know this story, but there's a guy, his name is Andy Dufresne, and Andy Dufresne is sent to prison for a crime he didn't commit. And while he's there, he meets a guy named Brooks. And Brooks eventually ends up getting paroled. But this is where the problem starts. You see, Brooks had lived more than half his life in prison. He'd been there for 42 years. You see, when Brooks went in, there was horse and buggies. And when he came out, there was electric cars. He went in and everything was in the country and now he's been put in a city. And he's given a job as a bagger in a grocery store. And he tries to function. He really does. He, he goes to work and he's trying to make it. But he's having a hard time because his mindset is still set in prison. He longs to go back. He actually plots ways to figure out how he could be sent back to prison. Because back there he knew what to expect. He knew what was going to happen. See, Brooks couldn't accept the freedom that he was given. Eventually, Brooks gives up. But you haven't seen the movie? That part's really sad. But you need to understand that when God is elevating you to that next level, he's always going to ask something of you.
Maybe it's the people speaking into your life. I'm not saying only listen to Christian people. What I'm telling you is that you need to make sure the people speaking into you are going in the same direction you are. If you're listening to the person that's plopped themselves down and is like, hey, this is perfect. I don't have to do anything else. I got my salvation. Life can happen around me. I'm good. Pastor Jerry, I, I, this is a happy spot right here. Yeah, life is, life is good. I got my job. You know, I'm paying off my fines. Everything's, everything's good here. So if that's the person you're listening to, but you're saying, man, I want to get more of God. I want to go further. I want to know. I want to grow. I want to serve. But that's the person you're hanging out with. Well, guess what? If you're tethered to them and they're just plopped themselves down, they're like, you know what? This is good. I'm happy. Yeah. I got everything I need. It's like those really cool armchairs where they've got, you know, the little sides that flip up so you can have your, you know, Coke can that's cooled over here. And you've got your remote control over here. And, you know, if they made a little tube so you wouldn't have to get up to pee, it would be even better. <laughs> Some of you have done that in your Christian walks. You've got, I've, I've got my spot. I'm good. Why well, do I have to get out of the chair? Look, I can flip the channel and watch Christian TV from here. I'm good. That's not what you were called to do. So if you're hanging on to those people that have plopped themselves down in the easy chair, yeah, believe me, those things are heavy. I've helped a couple people kneel you. I'm like, yeah, I won't touch that one. Yeah. Especially if they're motorized. Yeah, then they're going to go, yeah, no, no. So they got that kind of a weight holding you back. You're trying to say, I, I want to go. I want to go forward. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, but if that's what I've attached myself to, I'm never going to go up. See, some of you are sitting here and you're saying, I need a financial breakthrough. I need, my, I need to go to the next level with that. Some of you started giving back in September when Pastor taught on generous living. And that's an amazing start. You've taken one of the first steps that God said, do this. But for some of you, you're giving here. And that's a good place to give. But you know in your heart and your spirit, God's saying give here. Here's good. There's nothing wrong with here. But if he says go here, and you're still hanging out here, that's a weight that God's not going to be able to elevate you because you're not being obedient. Some of you need a breakthrough in your family. And it's going to cost you something to get that breakthrough. It's going to cost you being in God's house more. And that looks different for all of you. For some of you, you know, you're saying, I'm, I'm serving here. That's a good level. Some of you, God's calling to serve up here. And until you make that step to say, I'm going to be committed, you're never going to be elevated. Maybe being in God's house more looks like joining a Thursday night connect group. Maybe it means signing up for a priority one team. It means helping once a month in the parking lot or being an usher once a month. For some of you, you're like, I'm already serving. But you know what? God's calling you to say, I need a little more. Your, your serving here was good when you were back there, but, but you've told me you want to keep going up. So that's going to require more of you. It may mean you're on the prayer team, but you know what? God's saying, could you serve in the nursery once a month? Maybe you're an usher and, you know, you've been serving once a month. Could you help on the parking lot once a month on a different Sunday? I'm not telling you what to do. I'm giving you opportunities to say, you feel stuck. And I'm pointing out some things that you might need to look at in your life to say, how do I need to do it differently, God? God wants to transform you, but you first have to lay aside your sin. Whether it be shame, guilt, unforgiveness. Maybe it's service. Maybe it's a weight. You've got to lay that stuff aside before God can elevate you. The second thing God calls us to do is to stop and keep the Passover. 
Now, if you've been around church a long time, you know Passover is kind of really not a fun meal. It's really mostly gross. But I'm not calling you to actually eat real Passover meal. It's yeah. Eat before you go to Passover meal if you're ever invited to a real Jewish person's house. I promise you, you will thank you later. It's not really eating. Yeah, so, it sounds like this great thing that we're going to have all this food and, you know, you, they've been fasting and, yeah, no, it's really not. And it kind of smells funny and, yeah. Be glad you're not Jewish, mostly. There we go. You got nothing else out of this. There you go. But the reason that the Passover existed was because it was a symbolic representation of the people taking in God. They would eat this meal to be part of who God was, to fill up on God. So the Passover represents a filling up of Jesus in us. So what are you filling yourself up on? Are you hungry for Jesus? Are you hungry for his word? Are you hungry for his presence? in your life. See, the Israelites got used to God giving them manna while they were in the desert. While they wandered around for 40 years, this is kind of an interesting thing, if you're in kids' church, you know this. While the Israelites wandered around in, in the desert for 40 years, there, was, there wasn't any Walmarts or, you know, any kind of Nordstrom's or any clothing shops or whatever. God made it so the entire time they wandered in the desert, their shoes never, like, got holes in them. Their clothes never ripped. Because there wasn't, like, you know, like, there wasn't a Walmart that we could just, okay, everybody stop here. You know, this is the sixth month. You get your new dress. You get your new pair of sandals. And, you know, then everybody come back out and line back up, and we're going to go wander around some more. No, but there wasn't that ability. God took care of them and provided everything from their clothing to their food. Then yes, after a while, eating the same thing over and over again got tired. But he provided sustenance so they weren't dead. They ate man. In the Bible, they got tired of man. But God still took care of them. He didn't say it was going to be, you know, roast beef every day. He promised that he would take care of them. And he did. So they got this man. Every day, the man showed up. And every day, the Israelites could go out and get it, and they were fed. The interesting thing happens when the Israelites cross from the wilderness into the promised land is that God wasn't going to give them that anymore. See, God's not going to do what he's always done just because it's the way he did it before. God's not always going to do what he's always done just because he did it that way before. I see a lot of Christians who've stopped having faith because they have Christian habits. Let that sit there for a second. A lot of us don't have faith. We don't use faith. We don't need faith because we have our habits. Well, I come to church. I even tithe. I do what's expected of me. I'm good. Got my checklist. I checked it off. God, you and I were good, right? Yep, I did those things. So the Israelites were kind of shocked when they went to the promised land and God said, guess what? I give you this amazing land. You're going to plant your own crops. You're going to learn to feed yourselves. I'm not going to provide manna just because I always did. See, the manna formula of God giving it to us doesn't exist in the promised land because God wants to use the gifts and the talents and the abilities that he's placed inside you. That he's just been waiting for you to get elevated in your obedience so he can start using them. Gifts and talents and abilities that only you have. And he wants to 
to use them. He wants to use them to bring glory to his <laughs> kingdom. He wants to use them so you understand how important you are to him. But unless you're doing the other stuff, you're never going to realize what's already inside of you. You're not going to get to the promised land so God can use what he put inside of you. See, the difference between a wilderness Christian and a promised land Christian is that a wilderness Christian gets stuck in the past. In a hurt, in an offense, in a moment that you just can't move past. See, the best thing about Jesus is he gives you a life beyond your past. He wants to give you the promised land. See, the problem with our past and when we get stuck in it is because you made something someone did to you bigger than what God did for you. Maybe you missed that. You made something someone did to you bigger than what God did for you. So you're stuck out in the wilderness. And you're, you're going, I got manna, I guess. I've been eating manna for 20 years. Really? There's got to be something better. God's saying, yeah, the promised land is right there. If you change what you're doing, you'll get there. If you do what I ask in obedience, you'll get there. Didn't want you to think I made all this up, so I've got some scripture. Colossians 2, 12 through 14. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and your sinful nature was not yet cut away. See, I didn't make it up. God says cut it away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. It doesn't stop there. We're gonna hop over to Romans. Romans 6, verses 6 and 7. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Amen. Paul tells us the old is gone. Where we were, that's been forgiven. That's been forgotten. But because of that, we're asked to act in a new way. We've got to do new things. So I opened service this morning in Ephesians 4. And we're going to circle all the way back there. Ephesians 4, verses 20 to 29. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to condense the point. Because we already read a bunch of scripture. I don't want you to lose the point. The cool thing about the Bible is if you say, I don't know how to live. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, this may have been written a really long time ago. It was written for you. It applies today, and this is why. See, Ephesians 4, 20 through 29 tells us how to do it differently, how to take it to the next level. It tells us, stop telling lies, don't be controlled by your anger, stop stealing, and stop using foul language. Wow, did I just hit a nail on the head with any of you? Because for a few of you, I'm pretty sure on at least a pretty, you know, weekly basis, if not daily basis, at least one of those four things comes out of you. Whether it's stealing, lying, using foul language, being angry, God says stop those things. So don't tell me my Bible doesn't apply today, because you're <coughs> doing those things today. But the best part is, it doesn't just tell you what not to do. <coughs> Sometimes people go, well, those Ten Commandments, they just tell us everything we're not supposed to do. Well, 
Yes, there are a list of things to kind of, you know, if you stay away from those things, your life would be better. Perfect? No. But those verse, same verses go on to tell us what we should do, how we should act. We should be truthful. We should use our hands for good work. We should give generously to those in need. We should let everything we say be helpful and encouraging to others. How many of you at some point heard a parent say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all? Yeah. Yeah. Your mom didn't just make it up. It's actually a paraphrase of scripture. It's here to say, this is how God is going to help move you to the next level. you got to leave that old stuff behind. But see, the best part is it doesn't stop there. The part I read in verse 30 that's the most amazing part of this entire piece. Because it says he identifies us as his own. Guess what that means? Jesus claims you. <coughs> he chose you. He picks you. See, some of you sit there and you say, well, I don't have a family. Yes, you do. <coughs> I don't have a dad. Yes, you do. I don't have anyone that cares about me. Yes, you do. You have God. Yeah. You don't need the rest yeah. of it. What did I say today that made you think, Pastor Cherry was talking just to me? That's your starting point. What made you feel like it didn't matter who else was here? You should have today for God to say this to you. Now some of you today haven't even gotten on the elevator. And you're sitting there right now and you're saying, I want to make that change. I want to leave the old me behind and have a new life with Jesus. I want to be, get to the promised land. I want all the guilt and all the shame. I want it nailed to a cross. I don't want to ever take it with me again. So right now I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. And there's nothing magical about closing your eyes. As I tell the kids in kids' church, the whole reason we do it is so you're not focused on anybody else. Because this is your minute with God. If that's you today. And you say, I want to leave that old me behind. Will you raise your hand right now? If that's 
him and say, I don't want those pieces with me anymore. I'm going to ask everybody to repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For dying for me. For taking my sin and nailing it to a cross. I accept the forgiveness that you've given me. I'm ready to get on the elevator and be elevated to you. for the first time. I'm going to ask in a minute when we dismiss that you come down to the front. And I've got some decision team people who are going to be down here to meet you because they want to celebrate with you. 